Hi again, everyone. Bill Sheridan with the Maryland Association of CPAs. There are three new universal truths that I think we all need to come to grips with as we deal with change and complexity these days. The first is we need to be trying new things. We need to be thinking about innovation. The second is in order to make time for that innovation, we need to stop doing some things that aren't bringing us results anymore. And the third is we all need to be constantly learning new skills to stay ahead of that rate of change. Now, I had a chance to talk about all this with Rita McGrath. She's a renowned author and Columbia Business School professor. She was at the 2012 Digital Now conference in Orlando. She and I sat down and talked about all this and more. Here's what Rita had to say. So, Rita, after your presentation this morning, our CEO and CFO were talking, and my CEO said what I heard her say was that our opportunity portfolio isn't big enough. And our CFO said, really, because what I heard is... Uh, we need to stop doing some things. So, um, and, th and then we got talking about it a little bit further and realized those two things aren't mutually exclusive, are they? Um, no, they're not. And the, the trick of building a portfolio that's capable of driving sustained growth is, is doing the two things. One is making sure that you've got enough feelers and experiments going on so that you can begin to take action on options as they become open to you and you've got more information. But the other thing is there's a lot of things that any association would be doing that aren't really going to be the path to your future. So, and very often we don't really go through the portfolio and say, why are we doing this? So what you'll find is a lot of activities in an association are there because they were necessary at some point. They solved a real problem for members sometime in the past. Um, or because they're somebody's pet project. <laughs> and that's often harder just to stop. But uh, what you can find is that freeing resources from doing those things is often where you get the slack to go pursue something new. And it's really important, I think, every so often to just go through your whole book of business and ask the question, why are we doing this? So an example would be um, producing a quarterly newsletter that tells everybody you know, who's got new jobs or whatever. Well, you know, LinkedIn can do that today with a fraction of the cost, and people can do it on demand. So the newsletter kind of really isn't that good a use of scarce organizational resources, and you might want to consider uh, dropping it. Right. And, uh, and I think you refer to that as kind of disengagement, is that right? Now, I, and on the flip side of that is um, this idea of innovation. And, and things are so complex, as, as, as you discussed earlier today. Um, and this notion of, of being innovative is, is almost a requirement now going forward. How, why is this so important? The reason innovation is an option to organizations today is that as the pace of change picks up, you constantly need to be refreshing your source of advantage or your source of service or your source of competitive differentiation. In the past, when things moved a little bit more slowly, most organizations put their emphasis on the exploitation of an existing advantage. So, you know, you, you had this idea of sustainable competitive advantage, and the thing you wanted to do was optimize and, and get the most out of it and become lean and, and really, you know, become very focused. In today's organizations, if a competitive advantage doesn't last very long, you need to be continually building that pipeline of new things that you can do, new sources of differentiation. And so innovation, to me, in the best-run companies, has gone from being something that's kind of a nice to do. It's, oh, how cute, innovation. You know, it's become really central to the way organizations need to behave. I'd also say that the most powerful form of innovation that companies are pursuing now has to do with uh, customer experience. And so we often think of innovation as a new technology or some new invention. But what you'll find is that often great advantages can be gained by innovating the customer experience. So as an example, today we're seeing all kinds of innovation around the simple practice of payment. So we've got a square machine, we've got phone devices, we've got credit cards in there. Um, and what they're competing to do is offer the easiest, most convenient payment system. And the company that wins that has a huge foot in the door to offering other kinds of services. Because if I prefer to use your organization for payments, it's a bit of an entry barrier to have to go switch to somebody else's payment form if I really like yours the best. So that's an example. Mm -hmm. um, and our members that are and certainly everybody else is feeling the same pressure. Uh, they're, they're just so busy with the day-to-day, -day, their heads down, working on on what needs to be done right now. Uh, and in the meantime, there's all these changes being thrown at them from, from all directions. Where do they find the bandwidth, or, or what steps can they take to, to, you know, kind of, you know, take a breather, lift their heads up, and notice what's going on around them, and say, okay, I need to be doing 
something else different. Yeah, I actually see this need to create thinking space and head means and get yourself out of the day-to-day -day as a crucial place for associations to add value, for universities to add value, for external players who aren't so deeply enmeshed in getting today's job done. Uh, as an association, for example, I think one of the things you can really help with is you can spend some time thinking about stuff. You know, you can spend some time bringing in the thought leaders. You can spend some time saying, hey, what are the really forward-thinking books that our members should be thinking about? And then present that to your membership in a way that makes it digestible for them. Um, you, your conferences give them the time out. You know, maybe your web presence gives them the new ideas. So I think that's actually a place where someone like an association can make a big difference. The other thing that I think is really important is for people to book some time with themselves to think. You know, I have a friend who put this really well. She said, ah, oh, I finally graduated to amoeba management. I said, what's amoeba management? She says, it's stimulus response, stimulus response all day long. <laughs> and then instead, you know, what I want is to carve a little bit out of a week or a month or uh, whatever to, um, to, to do some thinking time. At Columbia, we often encourage people to keep a journal, a reflection journal and to be as creative with it as possible. So cut things out of the magazines, you know, uh, write in crayon, uh, get a 10-year-old to give you a, a speech or something to put in it. Um, but take, you know, half an hour a day or half an hour once a week and, and really kind of look at what's going on in your world, what are some things you need to be paying attention to, and just give yourself that, that thinking time. Um, it's ironic to me, you know, if, if, if a boss walks by your desk, right, and you're sitting there staring at the Scots ceiling lost in space. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, you know, I'm reflecting deeply about the massive changes that are about to influence our industry. I mean, nobody does that, right? Uh, and yet we know we need to. So I think there's a fine line between finding the external resources that can really help you and, uh, and, and making sure you have the time and the space to do that. Um, and I guess kind of related to that, uh, you know, lifelong learning is really embedded in, in a CPA's mm -hmm. DNA that, that you know, they have to keep up right. with those requirements to, to keep their designation. And, and uh, uh, so often the, the skills that they're, they're seeking out, um, you know, kind of play to the core of their business. Mm -hmm. A lot of technical skills, things like that. Are there, um, are there new skills that you think that folks need to yeah. be seeking out and learning to deal with the, the change in complexity that, that is facing them? Well, if you think about the lifelong education of the CPA, I think there are a couple of places where I at least would love to see the profession spend a little more time. Um, the first has to do with how current accounting systems actually cause companies to do dysfunctional things. Uh, take, for example, depreciation schedules. Um, what our accounting systems don't take into account is that the competitive life of an asset and the accounting life of an asset are two different things. And so I think we need accountants who can understand that and then demonstrate to their clients how to handle that best in the context of the company's financial system. So that's one. I also think many of our time-honored metrics that have to do with project evaluation, things like value calculation, uh, things like um, the capital asset pricing model, Again, net present value, you know, a lot of times if you don't get the assumptions right, you're actually crippling your company's ability to do new things because net present value kind of assumes today is going to be steady state. Well, what if today goes away? You know, your net present value is meaningless uh, if you don't have a steady state to compare it to. So I really think the better accountants are going to be able to, first of all, grapple with those problems and secondly, help their clients understand how just because it's the right thing to do accounting-wise doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do business-wise and how do you deal with that.